So Katia, let me know when we start. We are live now. Good morning. Okay. My name is Nicolas Veron. On behalf of Google, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome all participants uh, to this event uh, the, on insurance in Europe and the difficulties that may be associated both with the current pandemic uh, developments, but also looking ahead to the future on how insurance can help uh, manage catastrophic events uh, or uh, certainly uh, not contribute to uncertainty in the outlook of economic actors. So we have a great panel this uh, morning or afternoon if you're joining uh, from uh, Europe or evening if you're joining from Asia. Um, I say morning because I'm in the US right now. We have a great panel uh, to address this, uh, mixing a number of different perspectives. Uh, Frédéric de Courtois will speak first. He's the general manager of Generali uh, and as such manages directly um, a number of the key functions uh, of this uh, European champion of insurance uh, under the leadership of the CEO. Uh, he's been uh, in the insurance uh, industry for most of his professional career at uh, the French-based uh, group uh, UAK, uh, which became AXA in 1997, uh, and he joined Generali, I think, in 2016. Uh, Gabriel Bernardino is well known to many in our, our audience. He's the chairman of uh, EIOPA. He's actually been the chairman of the European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority since uh, the inception and even before because uh, from 2009, I think, to 2011, when AIOPA was created, uh, he was the head of uh, the predecessor body as the Committee of European Insurance and Occupational Pension Supervisors, SEIOPS. And Gabriel is uh, a mathematician by training, uh, so he uh, also has no um, uh, complexes vis-a-vis -vis the uh, highly quantitative aspects of the insurance business. Uh, third on the panel is Dirk Schoenmacher, who, of course, is a non-resident senior fellow at Bruegel uh, and also somebody with a very rich uh, public policy experience as well as academic experience. Uh, he's a professor of banking and finance at the Rotterdam School of Management uh, within the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And uh, he also worked uh, at the uh, Netherlands Ministry of Finance. Uh, for a decade from 1998 to 2008, uh, also has experience at the Bank of England earlier on and uh, as a consultant for the IMF, the OECD and the European Commission. Uh, and Dirk uh, has both uh, general expertise uh, as uh, in, uh, in matters of economic and financial um, challenges, but also uh, has looked at the insurance sector more specifically in terms, especially of its cross-border uh, development. So I'm looking forward to a very rich uh, discussion and um, I will uh, also, uh, before giving the floor to Frédéric de Courtois, want to warmly thank the organization team at Bruegel, which uh, as usual is doing a stellar job in making these events uh, happen and run smoothly. So many thanks to uh, Katja Knezevic, to uh, Giuseppe Porcaro, and to the whole team there for providing uh, extraordinary support for this. So, Frederick. Thank you, Nicolas. Good afternoon to you all. Happy to be with you. You are correct. So I, I'm, I'm the general manager of Generali. You know that I'm also the, the vice president of Insurance Europe. I've been appointed to lead this uh, brainstorming on potential future pandemics cover but uh, I'm speaking here today as the general manager of Generali. So a few words from me on this, uh, on this pandemic, on the, on the impact on the, on the insurance industry. Maybe first, let's look at the impact on the insurance industry and then a few words on, uh, on how we've interacted with our, with our clients uh, during this uh, difficult months. If I look at the impact, the first one, of course, is the financial impact. 
as analysts would say, that's a, a result event. That's not a capital event or a liquidity event. That's a result event in the sense that it will have a significant negative impact on the result of the insurance industry in 2020. I mean, the Lloyds had the issued a few weeks ago a paper saying that it's a, it's a hundred billion claim and it has a hundred billion impact on the asset side, more or less. So probably now that the impact on the asset on the asset side has reduced, but for sure this is a significant uh, result event. It is not a solvency event. I mean the the solvency of insurance companies have remained very solid. Uh, this is also the case for for Generali, and this is not a liquidity event in the sense that the liquidity has also remained very good. And of course we all understand that insurance companies from this as a as a competitive advantage in the sense that they, they receive premium before they pay claims. So by, by, by definition, the liquidity of the insurance company is good, even if I have to say this kind of crisis re requires a strong monitoring of the liquidity from the regulator, of course, but also from the, from the insurance companies. So in a nutshell, this is the impact on the, on the insurance company. The financial impact is not the only one. I think that's interesting to discuss briefly about the reputation impact on the insurance industry. And here, this is interesting to see that the reputation impact has been very different from one country to the other in Europe. Globally in Europe, there hasn't been a strong reputation impact, but uh, there has been a, a negative impact in some countries I'm talking especially about France, to a lesser extent, the UK. And I think it's fair to say that the insurance industry has not always communicated well. We sometimes struggle to communicate on this, maybe because we are dealing with uh, quite uh, technical matters. And citizens uh, also uh, have some understandings about our business. They, they see the insurance companies as a big balance sheet. They often forget that our balance sheet is the money from our client. So see, this is their money. So this is not money which is available to pay what, whatever claim, even the claims with, which are not insured. So I think this is the first misunderstanding. And the second misunderstanding is that too often uh, people consider that insurance companies and banks are similar and that insurance companies may have solvency or liquidity issues as banks may have in, in those difficult circumstances. And again, uh, insurance companies are much less sensitive from a solvency and liquidity point of view compared, compared to banks. So I think globally, there has not been any strong reputation impact but because of what happened in France and to a lesser extent to the UK, it's fair to say that the end result is negative for the reputation of the, of the insurance industry. A word uh, before uh, I give the word to whomever, a word about how we behaved during this crisis. So I think first, it's fair to say that we've been resilient. So the insurance industry has not asked for any state guarantee or whatever. So we've continued to behave and to act as a private company with adequate solvency and liquidity, as I said. The second important point is that we've uh, assured the continuity of service, which was not a given because none of us was expecting such a crisis. And uh, even in our, in our BCM plan, we never had considered that all countries in Europe would be stopped at the same time and that all functions would be stopped at the same time. You, you know, in our BCM plans, we usually consider an earthquake somewhere, a fire somewhere, but we had not considered such, a, such an impact. And, and BCM, sorry to interrupt, is business continuity management, business, right? Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Nicolas. I'm always the acronym police here. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and... Uh, and I think globally, we've been good at that. We've been good because our agents have reacted and behaved well. 
and we've been good because we've been able very quickly to move almost all our employees in smart working. So if I take the example of, of Generali, in a few days, we had 90% of our employees in smart working answering to the phone and paying claims. So we've been able to uh, continue our service to the, to the society. Last but not least, I think there have been a lot of uh, actions from uh, insurance companies to support the community. So of course, we, we've paid the claims, but this is a given, and this is what I've said when, I, when I'm saying continuity of service. But in addition to the contracts we have, we've implemented a, a lot of actions to support our communities. If I take the example of the Generali Group, a few days after the, the lockdown, we've launched this uh, 100 million fund to support our local communities. And I can tell you today that not only the 100 million fund has been, has been invested, but the effort from the Generali Group is a multiple of this 100 million fund. So, which coming back to the, and I'll stop here, to the reputation issue, for the insurance industry is a paradox because the insurance industry has been extremely active. And at the end, this is the industry which from a reputation point of view has been the most impacted because, uh, following this pandemic. So I think this is also a good, a good subject to discuss. Now, to, cl to close this uh, short introduction, I would say that we need to work hard with the AOPA and the commission to prepare what is next to prepare to relaunch the European economy, but also possibly, if possible, but I'm sure you will have questions on this, to build uh, better pandemics cover, especially on business interruption. Gabriel. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas, and thanks uh, to Bruegel, of course, for organizing this and Tori inviting me. Very happy to um, be part of this discussion. You know, as Frederick mentioned, of course, uh, the, the the crisis hit it hard. Uh, you know, insurers. Uh, you know, not only from an operational perspective, and I couldn't agree more what uh, Frederick said that the insurance industry gave really, uh, I think, a fantastic response in that sense. You know, really quickly adapting to the situation and and focusing on, on servicing clients and paying claims, et cetera. So that I think from an operational perspective has been, I would say quite a, quite a good reaction, but of course also a lot of implications on both on the asset and on, on the liability side. Now on that, I think uh, that, you know, until now the situation has been manageable. Of course, this will be in any way one of the biggest events in the, in the history of, uh, of insurance in terms of claims for sure. But of course, uh, the jury is still out there because there's a lot of uncertainty also with the economic impacts that we see out there in the in the real economy that will affect the uh, insurance for sure. Now, it's in, when we look at uh, you know uh, the, the the kind of evolution also of the crisis, it's interesting looking at what insurers usually have as their kind of uh, you know uh, the, the, the pandemic scenarios that they have of course also in their models and and these these pandemic scenarios usually they are very focused very much focused on the life uh, side you know with mortality elements of course but also on the health uh, on the health side and that's where of course also uh, the situation started uh, to to peak on the insurance sector but then there was an event that changed the profile of, of the risk and of the situation, which was, of course, the decisions by, by, by states on lockdowns and, 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 and having this, of course, generalized worldwide and, of course, in Europe, definitely the case. This transformed uh, uh, the kind of the, the pandemic uh, uh, focus from the, a life and health focused uh, situation to a more property and casualty, uh, you know, with a more focus, of course, on travel insurance, on event cancellation, where a number of losses are coming from that, and definitely on business interruption. So it's interesting to see that, of course, the profile of the crisis also uh, changed uh, due to the to the lockdowns, uh, uh, definitely. Now, the biggest issue, as, uh, as it was mentioned by Frederic, and I, I agree with him that this created this element of reputational risk also, uh, the biggest issue have been, of course, this, uh, this element of, of, of business interruption, and especially 
what we call non-damage uh, business interruptions, where business interruption is forced not by you know, a flood, a uh, fire, but by uh, in a situation like a lockdown uh, uh, coming from, of course, uh, government decisions. What we see is, of course, uh, different in different countries. It's true because uh, it also depends on the products that are sold in the different countries. And, and this is becoming really granular uh, because, of course, uh, there have been some countries where uh, companies have taken some steps, uh, you know, together with uh, the local authorities and uh, the businesses, and they have agreed on uh, somehow having a partial compensation, even though they believe that they are not, uh, it was not included in the contracts. Uh, in the other places, it goes really deep to the interpretation of what are the, are the contractual conditions. And this is something that I think we need to learn as a lesson also for the future. So we see, uh, you know, a very good number of contracts where the exclusions are clear, so that's 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 taken. There are also very good number of contracts where there's the exclusions are not so clear, and so insurers have been paying, and that has been, of course, also our message. And then there's the kind of uh, you know the gray zone areas where contracts are subject to interpretation. There is a lot of dispute already, some litigation, and this brings, of course, this reputational issue. Uh, this litigation, of course, uh, brings uncertainty also from a, from a financial solvency perspective, but also brings this reputational risk uh, out there. From AOPA, we have been, I think, very clear in, uh, in our statements outside on the expectation from our side that uh, it is, of course, fundamental that insurers uh, you know, are clear towards policyholders, that they explain to policyholders what are the coverages, what, are, what is included, what is excluded. But also, of course, fundamental that when this is covered, they pay the claims. And we have seen, I think, that in various occasions. We have been also on the other side very clear as part of our you know, logic of looking, looking at the crisis also from a, a, a capital perspective and a, and a policyholder perspective, that uh, if uh, these uh, um, claims are not uh, included in the contracts, that we will really caution against uh, any kind of uh, initiatives forcing uh, retros uh, retrospective coverage, because we believe that that can create also, uh, you know, further issues in terms of market stability and put in question also the policyholder protection overall. You know, you cannot just benefit the part of your policyholders. You need to look at uh, the entirety of policyholders. So some caution definitely on this element of retroactive coverage. Just to finalize and for the future, you know, we are, of course, very much focused on, you know, uh, putting this element of especially the non damage business interruption in the context of what we call the protection gaps. You know, this is something that we have already started to work last year. Uh, you may have seen from AOPA side, we started to work also in these areas related to uh, more catastrophic risks. And I think that the COVID crisis showed us clearly, uh, you know, bring to the surface another type of protection gap in this area of non damage business interruption. I want to be very clear from, you know, our own perspective is that, uh, you know, this is a risk, this non-damage business interruption is a risk that it cannot be just, uh, you know, uh, covered by the insurance sector by itself. You know, it's a risk which is not diversifiable, especially, of course, when it comes from these uh, lockdowns. Uh, it's, it's not mutualizable. So I think it's uh, very difficult, of course, to have insurance industry covering this kind of risk, also because... It's an issue about capacity and the amounts that we're talking about are, of course, huge if we talk about, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the whole economy uh, at, in, in most of the countries. So our point has been, you know, to approach uh, both uh, insurance sector, but also the business uh, side to get together and to try to try to build up a framework where, you know, we can have a coverage of this type of risks with the participation both from the insurance industry, but also definitely the participation at state level. And I think that there are good examples out there. And, uh, and you know, from our side, uh, you know, we're very uh, eager, of course, to have this engagement. As Frederick mentioned, we are, you know, we're having, uh, as we speak, these conversations. I'm, I'm encouraged by what I hear. I believe it's fundamental that we all understand as a society that these are resilience gaps that are out there. And at the end of the day, it's all of us as society and end up ending up with governments that will pay for it if there's no solution. Insurers will not be the silver bullet for solving this, to be honest, as they cannot be also for other types of 
more systemic risks, but I truly believe that insurers can and should be part of the solution. And that's what uh, you know we're working right now uh, with both the supply and the demand side, trying to bring uh, some proposals, also involving Europe, uh, because uh, you know if we think about uh, an events like this, this is this doesn't. It is an event that's not relevant just for one country, of course, and this is relevant for all the European Union. And we believe that there should be some elements of uh, good risk assessment, good data available, uh, you know, a good risk definition to have products that can deliver and avoid these uh, discussions about what is covered or not. But also to to do a lot of on risk prevention that all of us as citizens, uh, companies, Mm -hmm. but also governments can do on protection and uh, and having these risk prevention elements. And finally, to find ways to combine uh, some, you know, private and public uh, elements on on a risk transfer with a role, I hope also to uh, Europe at the end of the day, maybe also pulling these risks and having the capacity to deliver on the message that we very know now from uh, from the new commission that uh, we want to deliver a Europe that protects, you know, a Europe that protects should be, uh, you know, at this front of uh, the results of a pandemic. Thank you. Uh, and uh, indeed, we'll come back to this issue of uh, pandemic coverage and, uh, and how to think about it going forward beyond the current uh, episode, um, because sadly, uh, maybe it's the first uh, in the century, but not the last. Um, one thing I should have said at the beginning, uh, but uh, hopefully it's not too late, which is, um, as usual in those web events, we at Bruegel use a platform called uh, Slidos, sli.do, uh, and that's a platform that we use for uh, gathering questions from the audience. So you can go to Slido, use the uh, um, code uh, insure, I-N-S-U-R-E, so hashtag insure, uh, and that gives you access to the uh, question and answer platform. So uh, some participants have already started asking questions. You can ask questions anonymously or even uh, more user-friendly from the perspective of this moderator. Uh, If you're willing to give your name, please do, so I can refer to it. Uh, and I'm already starting collecting questions for the q and session. But before we get to this, uh, Dirk, um, uh, the floor is yours to uh, give uh, a bit more of an external perspective uh, on these uh, challenges. Thank you, Nicholas, and welcome everybody uh, to this webinar. And um, what I would like to do is to, uh, to uh, broaden the discussion to the economic impact because uh, uh, Frederick and uh, KB were already referring to uh, country differences. And as we know now, we have Europe and we have the Euro area. We can also look at it from a sectoral perspective. So if I move to my first slide on the stock market, I'm, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. So this is the stock market, um, Stock Europe 600. You may you want to enter full screen mode, uh, Dirk. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at it, um, uh, what you see is uh, a deep dive, and the first deep dive is 36 percent uh, when it happened, and then when the stimulus packages uh, kicked in, uh, you see a rebound, and and then the, it went back to 24 percent. I would say almost only, but it's still a lot. And I think that stresses the point of uh, Gabriel very much that uh, we really need the public and the private sector working together in uh, in recovery. And I couldn't agree more that both sides uh, have to deliver together. Um, Going to my next slide and the last one. Um, Here you see the the differences by sector. So let me just explain. So what you see is um, first the shock, what happened till March, and then from the 1st of January, and then from the 1st of January till April, when the the market rebounded a little bit. And I I have about 20 sectors. And what I did for you, I made uh, the the mostly hit sectors red so that we can focus on them. And just to, to show, and we have this uh, business interruption insurance. But the, uh, the difference 
the impact across uh, different sectors is very different. For example, I'm at a public university. Uh, we are not going to repay uh, tuition fees, but we make a lot of effort to do online uh, lectures. So we, 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 we continue as much as business as usual. And, and you see also education uh, not much affected. However, we know quite a few sectors are heavily hit. Mining, manufacturing, construction, uh, transport, and, and transport is, has been hit a lot because we, we need, we just don't need the transport. Accommodation and food service, uh, financial services, and including insurance. And I agree that most is on the banking side, but let's be honest, the insurance side has also made losses uh, on the balance sheet. Um, then the administrative part, and then at the bottom, the arts part, which is almost mostly hit because it is very much uh, works through public uh, public uh, subsidies, and they are on the at the bottom of the list for government. So uh, um, that sector is also very much hit. So I, I, just the main message is uh, it is very uh, the impact has been very different across sectors, and 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 then the next item is if you're heavily hit then it makes no sense to give loans from Europe or from national governments because if you're hit and your equity is almost away you need equity you don't need more loans so all the airlines are now getting a lot of loans and that's not going to help because uh, they have a hole in the solvency so uh, we can take away the the slides uh, and just move to the general screen. Um, uh, so my main message for the economic recovery plan is that we should get away from this idea that just we give a few loans and they are happily repaid in a few years. It's not realistic. Uh, so we really need uh, and many colleagues of mine, many academics, uh, including myself, we, we make a strong plea for the European Recovery Fund to have a big equity part in it. Be uh, because the good news of equity is you give equity, if it goes wrong, well, bad luck, uh, and really bad luck, but okay. But if it goes right, then the government as investor gets uh, also the upside from it. So it is, uh, but at least you don't overburden companies with more loans. So uh, what we are doing now, like with airlines in different countries, first of all, we are going to finance overcapacity. We will all fly less in the coming years. So we really, we really need to reduce overcapacity. So my first plea is to your be realistic. Uh, don't finance business as usual. Second, do more on equity, less on loans. And third, Please uh, listen to my country fellow man, uh, Mr. Timmermans, and put green conditions on the recovery package because we hope we will get out of this crisis, that's clear. But let's prevent that we are uh, straight away dipping in the next uh, climate crisis, but work on that already now. So uh, give equity and put green conditions on, uh, on the recovery so that we have an, more an overall uh, start of the restart reboot of the economy thanks Dirk. and obviously that went a little bit beyond our topic today on insurance but uh, it was good to hear especially uh, and this will not have escaped uh, any of our listeners uh, as you're making this plea from uh, the beautiful uh, countryside of the netherlands uh, i'd like to uh, come back to the um, issue of insurance uh, business and uh, especially this issue of balance sheet and the um, uh, impact on, uh, on P&L and uh, the financial structure of insurance. Uh, there's a question already on our Slido platform about insurers' dividends, and that's, uh, that's maybe a good way to start, especially with those two participants, because generally it's one of those companies which uh, I guess I can put it that way, um, uh, opted to uh, at least temporarily ignore the AOPA recommendations on this and keep uh, distributing dividends to their shareholders, whereby AOPA under Gabriel's leadership has uh, recommended um, 
putting the emphasis on capital preservation. So I'd like to hear both Frederick and Gabriel on this. Uh, the specific issue of dividend distribution, which got a lot of attention, and the broader issue of balance sheet soundness, even so Frederick already uh, told us about it. We start, Frederick. Gabriel? Frederick first. Fine. No, Frederick first, yeah. Ah, Frederick first, okay. So <laughs> on this, first, EOPA and the companies have different roles. And I understand EOPA saying that companies need to be cautious and take into account the difficult environment. Then only the companies know exactly what their situation is from a solvency and, and, and liquidity point of view, know what their context is. And I think it's good that company can, uh, can form their own judgment on their capacity to pay dividends. So you know that uh, generally we've made a decision to split the dividend into two. So we've paid uh, the first part as, as planned. And we've said that uh, in November at year end, uh, taking into account the, the situation of the company, taking into account the context and listening to the regulators, our board will decide whether to, to pay the, the second French. And I think this is a, a decision which both recognizes the situation of Generali, which is extremely solid and from uh, pure solvency and liquidity point of view, we were fully able to pay 100% of the dividend over the past weeks, but we've also listened to the regulators and we, say, and we said, let's be cautious and let's split it into two. And again, the, the, I understand the general statement of cautious, and I think it's good that then in each country and in each specific company, the board make their decision based on the specific situation. Yeah. Can I come in then, uh, Nicola? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Sorry. Very good. And, uh, you know, as you can imagine, I will not uh, comment on specific case of uh, Generali or other company, of course, that's up to uh, Frederic. No, but I'll, of course I can, uh, and I will give you uh, what, you know, the, the what is the rationale and the flavor, of course, that we uh, had in this? And uh, I think it's very important to understand that, uh, and we've, we've sent that message very early also uh, at the beginning of the crisis that, you know, we believe that uh, the sector is, uh, you know, well equipped uh, to deal with this kind of uh, crisis, with this kind of situations. The, the sector has been robust also, let's be clear, because of, uh, you know, uh, Solvency 2 that, of course, brings uh, you know, a good level of capitalization for the sector. And it, uh, it has, of course, uh, you know, good some shock absorption that, uh, that can be taken. Now, the reality is that, uh, you know, where we were, of course, at, uh, in March and where, you know, by and large, where we are still today, it is a lot of uncertainty. And, and we've seen, of course, uh, from all the angles, be it on the asset side, you know, all the, the volatility that existed on the, you know, on, on equity markets, they have rebounded, of course, right now. Uh, we wonder if this is, uh, you know, really linked to the fundamentals of uh, of the companies, and uh, and if we will not see another correction, so some some caution also on there, uh, but definitely also on the on what we talk about the claims. This is a you know a, a result event as uh, as Frederic was mentioned, and uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty still in terms of uh, payments of claims, like in BI in business interruption, as as we mentioned. So all in all. The, the, the picture is, you know, we have a sector that is sufficiently robust at the beginning of the crisis. That's the good thing that has, uh, you know, I think a possibility to absorb uh, the shocks. Now the uncertainty uh, is from all the angles. It resembles a lot of uh, what we tested in one of our stress test scenarios, so what we call the double lead uh, scenario a couple of years ago, because of course it affects you both on the asset and on the liability side. We saw, of course, uh, that all these massive interventions by central banks, uh, uh, what they have done also to the to interest rates and to the, you know, what uh, we've seen now the swap curves, for example, being completely flattened, uh, you know, beyond 10 years. And, uh, and that has a huge impact in the liability of insurers because it makes them go, go higher. So there's a number of effects, a number of uncertainty out there. And so in all this, uh, in all this ambience, what we have said, uh, and, and this was something which was uh, really, uh, you know, uh, quasi-unanimous at, uh, at my board, I must say, 
was to give this word of uh, caution, this word, this word of, uh, you know, take a stance, uh, uh, but look at the situation. We don't know seriously as a, as a supervisors, but I believe also in the industry, we don't know if this is an event that will go beyond the 99.5 confidence level that we have in Solvency 2. So while we don't have evidence that that's not the case, uh, we need to be cautious and we we uh, we put forward this uh, this recommendation clearly in terms of a temporary. It's not to it to ban the dividend. It's to temporarily uh, suspend it until uh, until more clarity is out there about uh, about what uh, what the crisis will unfold. Now, in the current situation, let's be honest. Uh, uh, this is was uh, as Frederick said also uh, taken uh, by the different companies throughout Europe. I think that there's a huge, uh, a huge number of them that decided to, uh, you know, to, uh, to have this temporary suspension. Others decided to, uh, as it was the case of Generali, to, you know, split it and uh, to wait uh, more. So I think that this is also something that uh, we, we are monitoring, of course. But this element of uncertainty is quite an important one. And I just wanted to mention also, you know, I think we need to understand what is the reflection of uh, really a truly economic crisis because you know we cannot have a situation where double digit uh, uh, moves on GDP contraction will not have an effect. Uh, this will have an effect, let's be honest. And uh, what mm -hmm. Dirk showed what Dirk showed on the economics uh, on the different areas of the economy, it's clear. So we will face for sure you know credit downgrades we will face uh, probably some defaults in some sectors of the economy this will have also an impact in the insurance uh, uh, on the asset side but also an impact in the insurance business model because this will have an impact on the economic activity on the disposable income of households so i think some prudence there is uh, is important I'll, uh, I'll give Derek the floor, but, uh, but I want to, um, obviously, I don't want to overemphasize the antagonism. I think it's uh, very clear that we have different perspectives here, but if it's not inappropriate, uh, I'd like to um, query you, uh, Gabrielle, further on the difference with what we've seen in the banking sector, because obviously uh, the EBA, but perhaps even more so the uh, European Central Bank in its capacity as banking supervisor, uh, has made recommendations which are on paper very similar to the ones you have made, but we have seen a different impact because the banks, you know, some of them grumbled, but in the end, they all came into line and uh, except those which had already taken legally binding decisions, they have all suspended dividends, but we have seen something different as we see uh, in the insurance industry. So, so is it something that leads you to uh, recommendations of legislative change or how do you think about this difference between the two sectors? Yeah. Banking and insurance? No, that's of course a very, very good question. And uh, you know, my personal view, and uh, that's of course uh, my, my own view, it's clear that uh, you know, in these kind of crisis situations, these type of approaches uh, in relation, for example, to uh, you know, recommendations on distribution of dividends, they should be taken centrally and there should be one decision. You know, believe me, the, the, the discussions that we had on the insurance side were the same that were there on the banking side, uh, let's be honest. The difference is that, of course, the SSM as, as banking supervisor, when it takes a decision, then it's one decision. And then, of course, you don't have the differences of approach also between different supervisors. So we have done what we can within the, within the current uh, framework. I believe that this is something that should be looked upon for the future. And, uh, and, and of course, insurance is different from banking. I'm not saying that this is a very similar situation. You know, I understand banks, of course, uh, and, and that was the rationale of banking supervisors to make sure that the lending to the economy will continue. But uh, let's be honest also on the insurance side, uh, you know, maybe insurers are stronger in terms of capital. I'm not uh, saying it uh, differently, but uh, the uncertainty around uh, the situation right now the fact that insurers are very much relevant also from an investment perspective. We need strongly capitalized insurers also to be part of the recovery through the investment uh, that they need to do, of course, in the, in the economy. And uh, at the end, also, we need to uh, insurers also that can have a counter-cyclical behavior. And uh, for example, in terms of these issues of the credit downgrades, the, the stronger a company will be, the better they will face, for example, movements from triple B to high yields, 
uh, on the credit side and not fulfilling, having a further self-fulfilling prophecy on, on the markets. And that's also a macro uh, angle that uh, was part of the discussions that we introduced also in the in the SRB discussion, and you have seen a recommendation from the SRB also in that uh, in in this direction on the dividend side. So that the ESRB is a European Systemic Risk Board. So sorry for that. Yes. And, um, and uh, luckily, this is a, a, a body that Derek knows very well because he's been on yeah, the yes. uh, advisory uh, uh, scientific council. So Derek. Yeah. Uh, first of all. Uh, um, uh, Gabriel, I wish you an insurance union. Uh, you know, I've written one paper on it and paper two. I will write together with Nicholas, so that, that will come. <laughs> um, uh, but more general, the issue of dividend is really puzzling me. I'm a finance professor and we all know that equity is about risk sharing. And I don't understand investors who say I expect the dividend each year the same amount, otherwise I don't trust the company. Because if we say uh, equity is about risk sharing, and we know, as you very well said, and I think Frederick also said very well, we have now uncertainty, then it is logical that you preserve your solvency, whether you're an insurance company or a bank or whatever. So our big institutional investors is telling the industry, please pay less dividends because we want you to stay through the crisis. And uh, if you take, for example, Shell, the first time since the Second World War, it has reduced dividend largely with a big amount. And now they are hit in the city in London. And you know, eh, if you're mentioned a few times in the Financial Times, then the time of a CEO is up. And I, I really feel sorry for my profession that we learn at school that equity is risk sharing and by demanding constant dividend, you treat equity as debt because you say each year I want the same amount of dividend. So my plea to the investors in the audience is please come back to uh, what equity is and think about equity as risk sharing. And if there is less dividend available, then keep it in the company and you get it later back uh, by a uh, surviving company. So I, I make a big plea for capital markets to be more lenient with varying levels of dividends. Uh, that's where we need to cushion macroeconomically. Uh, Frederick, you're uh, obviously an issuer uh, and you do pay dividends as we uh, mentioned, but you are also a big investor because uh, that's a, a big part of the insurance business. Uh, so you're on both sides of this divide. Uh, how do you react to what Derek just said? I think we shouldn't forget a few things. The first one is we tend to forget that dividends are paid to citizens that invest either for mutual funds or directly, and that a lot of them need dividend for their pension, for their retirement. So I think we shouldn't make confusion on, on this. And a group like Generali has always paid dividend because we know this. We know that uh, shareholders, little shareholders are waiting for their dividend and they, and, they, and they need it. Then I think we should address the, the, elephant in the, the, the elephants in the room. I mean, Gabriel addressed the first one, which is AOPA made a statement and then the regulators in the various countries reacted differently, which creates an issue and which created confusion for the investors because now investors are saying it's better to invest in Germany. So the cost of equity is yeah. lower in Germany because Bafin lets you pay dividend better than other countries. And I think this is an issue and I don't have the solution. I mean, Gabriele said that uh, there should be one central decision, but what I see is that it created confusion and it created issues, competitive issues between the, the, the insurance companies because if one following this as a cost of equity, which is lower, this is an issue. This is, this is the, 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 the first elephant in the room. The second elephant in the room is the credibility of the Solvency II framework. Because we've built, and Gabriel is uh, the, the master of this, of Solvency II and the Solvency II framework. We've built this uh, Solvency II framework, which is not perfect but which has so showed his resilience and his value. And 
when AIOPA issued the statement, his statement, the insurance industry had a solvency between 180% and 200%, which means to, let's say, twice the regulatory minimum to make it simple. And we all have as insurance company also prospective solvencies with scenarios. We have a risk appetite framework, which is uh, approved by regulators. So the question that all investors had was, why do regulators, uh, why don't regulators, why don't they want the, the insurance company to pay dividend, whereas the solvency is strong, the prospective solvency is strong. So in fact, we are losing clarity on this because what is important for the financial market is clarity on what you can, can do and what you cannot do. And we had sold the fact that we have a good risk appetite framework, that we have some thresholds, that if we are above some thresholds, we would pay the dividend. And all of a sudden, there is a, the news is, even if you are respecting everything, you cannot pay dividend. So the, these are, I think, the two elephants in the room, no easy solution, but I think it's fair to recognize that it has, has created a lot of confusion with analysts and investors. And, and a lot of work for insurance companies. <laughs> so, can I, uh, may I react yeah. on that? Yeah, briefly. Now, very, very brief on these two elephants. And uh, I, I couldn't agree more that these are the two elephants. And let me be very clear on how do I approach these two elephants, you know, uh, starting by the, by, by the second one. And to be very, very clear as I was, you know, I don't, I, I don't think that uh, the, the, the recommendation that we gave and the statement that we put out puts in question solvency too. I think on the contrary, to be very honest, we are very uh, you know, pleased with uh, the way that solvency two is uh, dealing with the situation until now. We know, of course, as uh, Frederick said, that uh, you know, solvency two is by, the, by default risk-based. It is, of course, uh, uh, you know, considering the evolutions and, uh, and, and changes in the risk profiles, and that's fine. The real issue is, and I've been very clear on that, is that you know the level of uncertainty because we are in in a very extraordinary situation. I think we should remind ourselves on that. You know, solvency two is not built up to ensure capital with hundred percent certainty, and no one can say. Still, I believe right now, if with all these levels of uncertainty coming from asset, from liability side, impact on the economy, GDP, etc. If the 99%, 99.5 confidence level of solvency two will not be uh, affected. That's, that's where we come with our prudent approach. But let me be very clear. We believe that solvency percent? two, we believe that solvency two, uh, you know, uh, has been clearly proving itself during the crisis. And we don't take that, uh, that uh, element that, uh, that we were going, of course, uh, you know, damaging solvency two. On the contrary. On, on the first one, and let me be very, very clear, you know, I totally understand what Frederick is saying. And that's, that's something that I regret, of course, because the fact that you have slightly, even if it is slightly different approaches by supervisors, which is what we have seen in some cases, it creates clearly the stigma effect. The ones that, you know, don't distribute dividends are started to be seen by the markets as weaker than the ones that distribute dividends. And this creates an unlevel playing field. And, and, and this is always bad, but in a crisis situation, I think it's even worse. And so that's why I really believe that, uh, you know, going forward, we should take care of this in order to make sure that these situations uh, will, not, uh, will not happen again. That was, uh, you know, what we could do, we have done it. So as a moderator, of course, I'm always uh, very um, happy when we have different perspectives coming together and a lot of candor in the discussion, which I think we've had uh, in this discussion on dividends. There are more questions on Slido on this, but we're probably not going to have the time to address them because I would like to move on to a different issue, which is uh, this issue of a future pandem pandemic uh, cover regime. And uh, we have a question here from Giacomo on Slido. Uh, what are the different mechanisms that government and insurers can use to cover um, this resilience gap? What can be argued to be the best mechanism and why? And I also relate that to uh, the issue of you know, cross-border consistency on this. Actually, the, the FT, the Financial Times, which many of us read among other sources, um, I had a, a big article on the last Friday where it quoted uh, your boss, Frederick, uh, Mr. Donet, CEO of Generali, 
saying, if countries don't act together, we'll get nowhere. So he uh, had very strong words on the need for uh, a really uh, cross-border coordinated uh, approach in terms of these discussions about pandemic coverage and the risk sharing, which several of us have already referred to, that has to be introduced, uh, I think, by general agreement between the public and the private sector. So the question is how to share the risk, not the general principle of risk sharing, and uh, can you give us a bit more about the options, the uh, precedents you're looking at, uh, this issue of cross-border coordination, both within the European Union and internationally. Um, so, so what, uh, uh, again, we, without spending too much time, because I'm conscious of time, but if you can give us the, 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 the main directions of this uh, very uh, impactful debate going forward, maybe starting with you, Gabrielle, and then I'll ask Frederick to comment. Yes, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, uh, we were very much uh, positive on approaching this and uh, what we called uh, shared resilient solutions, you know, so uh, solutions where, of course, um, you know, part of the, the funding overall will need to be shared. I, I think that, uh, you know, there are, of course, uh, uh, you know, various mechanisms, not for pandemics, but for other types of, uh, you know, more catastrophic risks in place already uh, throughout the world and also in Europe. So we are, of course, looking at uh, those, uh, those uh, solutions. I think that uh, there are definitely uh, four layers that uh, we need to explore there, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I really believe that the insurance sector needs to have skin in the game, uh, to be honest. And uh, that's, that's why insurance exists. Also, it's to protect, it's to, uh, you know, to, uh, to of course, have uh, coverage of, uh, of risks. And while we believe that it cannot cover the loan, I think it should be part of the solution also. So I would see a first layer of, uh, of insurance skin in the game, definitely. Also because uh, it, it, it brings uh, an incentive for good underwriting, which what also what we need, of course, uh, in, the, in any type of insurance. Then, of course, reinsurers uh, can also bring extra capacity. We could think also, as it is the case in, uh, in certain uh, mechanisms throughout the world, uh, on catastrophic risks to have uh, also market, uh, you know, market solutions, you know, capital markets being also put in the equation, uh, and then pooling solutions that uh, have been developed. Uh, some of them at your at a national level, so where you can have, uh, you know, part of the risk that then beyond a certain level. A certain layer is assumed uh, by by public authorities, and as a kind of a fourth layer, this element of uh, hopefully also being able to pull some of these risks at European level, which I think it would make a lot of sense, not only from a European, uh, I would say, as I mentioned, uh, you know, image towards the citizens uh, and the businesses in Europe in terms of protection, but also because I think it's more efficient from a financing and a financial perspective, also from uh, fr from you know the building up. Of these mechanisms. So, uh, as I said, uh, we're you know we're encouraged by the discussions that we have been having, and I hope that in the coming uh, in the coming weeks and months we can come with some uh, with some you know common hopefully common proposals. But also, if there are of course uh, uh, you know different views which will come, the devil is in the details, as you know. But that we can bring this to the European table also to have a discussion there. So let me ask a, a, an ignorant but kind of obvious question. Um, the European element of your uh, layering that you just presented uh, ultimately carries fiscal uh, contingent liability. And, uh, and as it happens, uh, there's a discussion on uh, fiscal uh, you know, um, expenditure at the European level right now with the plans that has been announced by Mrs. van der Leyen, the French-German uh, common uh, discourse on this and all that. Um, is there a connection between the two discussions? So is the, is the idea of a pandemic uh, coverage with a European component part of the uh, European budgetary MFF discussion or is it completely on a separate track? Well, for the time being, we haven't yet touched on that. Uh, you know, of course, we're dealing also uh, and the Commission is following our, our work. But, uh, you know, I, I imagine that uh, when and if we will talk about, uh, you know, a level of involvement from the Commission side, I think that this would make sense to be part also of the overall framework of the recovery. And, uh, and in that sense, there can be, of course, different solutions. But I think, that, as I said, that uh, also from an optimal uh, way of uh, using uh, public funds, uh, you know, nationally and at European level, I think that the, the, the 
the solution, the better solution would be to pull, uh, to pull these risks uh, also at the European level at the, at the last layer. That I think it will come as part of the discussion. Frederick, you mentioned your duties uh, in the trade body of the insurance industry in Europe, uh, insurance Europe. Uh, so can you give us a sense of uh, the discussions within the industry on this and, uh, and, and, and the options? First, I, I first speak as generally to say that I very much agree with what Gabriel has said and that if a scheme can work, this is the one that, uh, that Gabriel described. Let me first tell you before answering to your question on, on, the, on the discussions at the level of, of the industry, I think this is a huge technical challenge and this is a political question. Uh, the huge technical challenge is that this is a risk on which we have no historical data, no diversification and a lack of capacity because the, the, the risk is much higher than the, the, than the equity of the insurance companies across Europe. Yeah. So that's a bad start to build an insurance scheme. There are some positive facts, like the fact that there is little anti-selection. Sorry, I speak to insurers and little <laughs> moral hazard. But at the end, this is complex to build and it can only work with the public-private partnership. And this is that what, what, what Gabriel discussed. So we are, we are discussing this uh, between the uh, the countries in Europe at the level of insurance Europe, we are working with PAVE, which is a, a group of the CEO of the insurance companies. Gabriel is, uh, has created a brainstorming group on this. So we are all working to see how we could build this technical solution. What I can say to answer to your question, Nicola, is that here again, and I'm a, a very, I'm a true European, but that's interesting to see the attitudes in Europe, whereby you have some countries highly motivated with a lot of political pressure and some countries less motivated because they, they have less political pressure. And, so, and we have all the nuance between the two. <laughs> uh, I have no doubt that as Insurance Europe and as a European industry, we will find uh, a, a convergence but again, uh, the, the, the attitudes on, see, on this are still quite, uh, are still quite different. But what, what is the, and I stop here, what is the, the, the political question? And on this, that's not my job to answer the political questions. I mean, that's my job to answer the technical one and the technical challenge. But the political question is, if we only build national schemes, a lot of European citizens will stay uncovered. Can we accept this politically as, uh, as, uh, as Europe? Yeah. I believe no as a citizen, but I'm not the one who should give the answer. And I think that having this uh, last layer that Gabriel described, which is the European layer, which could look like something like the, the sure program, like unemployment. So it could be, it's a call on yes. some grant or on some loans or both. Uh, it could be also an incentive for the countries to develop their national scheme. We could say, for instance, you can access the European funds if you have built below your, your national schemes. Yeah. But my big worry is that we will have half of Europe covered and half of Europe uncovered, and we will discover this the next time we have a pandemic. That was a very clear and powerful uh response, I think. I have a small follow-up question. You, you mentioned the different perspectives from different countries while you were talking about the discussions within the industry. So should I infer from that there's a very high correlation between country of headquarters and policy position of the industry players, or am I going one step too far? A strong differentiation, sorry, I missed your last point between? A, a strong correlation, be, basically that within Insurance Europe, did I understood you correctly that insurers kind of relay or align with the policy positions of their respective member states, or it's more complicated than that? Uh, insurance Europe is made of uh, national representatives of the insurance industry. Oh, that's so, right. Uh, it's not. So they, are not they, are not they are not supposed. So they represent the insurance companies. I see. So they are. They are not 
government bodies. However, it's fair to say that there is some correlation with, the, with usually with the country position. I was confused because I thought of direct membership by the insurers, but you're right to remind us the members of Insurance Europe are the trade groups at the national level, correct? Yeah, they are the trade group representing the, nat the national companies. That's right. Can, can, I, can I add one element to the discussion? Um, I think this mechanism that Gabriel and Frederick describe is a very powerful mechanism. Uh, we have exactly the same in banking because uh, the US could do banking rescue from the federal level. Uh, like if one state has problems with banks, the state is not going down. And in Europe, we have seen uh, that that can happen. And I, I think it is exact, exactly the same with this pandemic insurance, the same with sure. So there is a big case from, from general economic principles. If you organize this, uh, you have more risk sharing capacity at a higher level. Yes. And I fully agree with Frederick's point, the social issue that half of Europe will have access and not the other half. I think that issue is extremely important. Yeah. And I think if the European Union wants to stand for something, it is equal access for everybody. And that is not depending on the wealth of your country. So I strongly endorse the plea for a European element. Um, and, and, and as... Um, I mean, I'm very ignorant about insurance, but I've worked a lot about deposit insurance, which is um, a particular form of insurance. And I think the, the similarities between what we're talking about in pandemic risk and uh, the risks that affect depositors uh, in situations of systemic fragility are hard to miss um, yeah. uh, with some Cypriot memories of 2013, uh, particularly. Uh, unfortunately, we're getting towards the end of this discussion and uh, we haven't uh, had nearly enough time to discuss all the topics and address all the questions uh, that were raised on Slido, but I think we, we had a, a very, in my judgment, very um, uh, stimulating discussion on some of the key issues. I'd like to ask a last question, which will go to Frederick, uh, which was asked on Slido by Julia. Uh, have any insurance lines uh, benefited from the crisis? And uh, where is it that you're having a business opportunity and not just a, a business challenge? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I can discuss this very directly, and I think we know that some insurance lines have benefited in the short term from the lockdown, especially the motor business line, because with the lockdown, there, has, there have been much less claims. Then the question is, what will happen after the lockdown? If we look at the experience in China, now everybody in China is driving and is not using anymore the public transport which could lead to higher claims experience after the lockdown. So this is a big question mark. Then to give a mid-term approach, it seems based on our market study in generally that people are more open and more keen to discuss about protection based on this experience, which of course will put pressure on the states and which could give a mid to long-term opportunity to the, to the insurance industry. Thank you very much. I want to thank again uh, all our panelists, uh, Derek Schoenmacher, Gabriel Bernardino, Frederic de Courtois, uh, thanking them for participating, but uh, perhaps even more for engaging with candor, which is uh, one of the highest qualities that we can have in that kind of discussions. Thanks again uh, to the organizing team at Bruegel. We'll have a number of other events there on the website. Uh, to discuss the issues related to COVID-19 and uh, the challenges that come with the current phase. Uh, have a great day or rest of or whatever remains of it. Uh, and I look forward to our next conversations. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks very much to all the participants. Thank you to you.